and for me it's good morning for some of you it's good evening a big welcome to our introduction to EIC CPF version 2.0 brought to you by the Society of American Archivists and the Technical Subcommittee on Encoded Archival Standards. Uh, I'm Karin Bredenberg, I'm the co-chair of TSEIS. Uh, my usual work is being at Kommunalförbundet Sydarkivera in Sweden. With me today I have the EIC CPF team lead Marie Ayla from the University of Buffalo, United States, and team member Kirsten Arnold from Archives Portal Europe Foundation and based in Germany, even if Archives Portal Europe is based in the whole of Europe. So welcome and um, we'll right to go start off right away. TCAS, uh, Technical Subcommittee on Encoded Archival Standards. I think you get why we are using acronyms. Uh, we have uh, on YouTube a short introduction to what we are and what we do. So that is possible to look at. Um, the presentation that we are using is already, already uploaded to GitHub. So it's possible for you to, to use that one to, go, to click on the links you need to download it because the links doesn't work in uh, when you view it on GitHub, but it's there for you to use. Uh, <clears throat> at the same time, we are available in a lot of different places. You will hear about some of them speci specifically today, but use the links in the presentation. When it's the work we do is following, we work with standards. We create the standards and we are following some revision, a couple of revision schedules. So everything we do, we have an annual rolling revision cycle for minor releases. That's something that's part of the maintenance we do. At the same time, uh, being in the, with the Society of American, Archi American Archivists, uh, our mother committee is the standards committee and they have a guideline that every fifth year you should start a big and major revision of the stand of your standards so that is what we have just finished with EAC CPF at the same time what we do is that in TSEAS we have design principles we have put up principles for how we design our standards and our XML schemas. And I'm just going to point you to the first one. Simplicity comes first. Everything should be simple to use and implement. So that's our primary goal. The other nine principles, I will let you read them on your own, but you will see during today's presentation that simplicity comes first has really go through all the work we have done. Getting everybody on the same page means that we decided that a short, short introduction to what EAC CPF is. So the acronym stands for Encoded Archival Context, Corporate Bodies, Person and Families. And I'm using slides and content developed by a number of people who is also available to look at uh, on the YouTube SAS YouTube channel, where you have a description uh, and introduction to what all the EIS standards are. So that's also possible to look at, but here is the short version of describing EIC CPF. So the goal is to describe corporate bodies, person and families related to archival material. And with corporate bodies, that's actually everything that is not a person or a family. So think about societies, uh, a small business and everything, that's a corporate body. And what we what the schema is, is actually the technical representation of the international standard on archival authority records, the SAR-CPF, coming from the uh, International Council of Archivists. So there you have all the elements. And if you have, when you read the SAR-CPF, the names and, and elements are, the same that we are using. We had to do some additions since we are talking about the technical format, but everything is there. We also rather quick, quick, quickly will end up in XML. So XML, extensible markup language. 
Uh, what you will see throughout the presentation is that we are describing elements, the things in brackets and attributes, the ones with the at sign. And that, that is the places where we put the information that we are encoding. Um, these elements can be grouped, can be grouped in a hierarchical structure, meaning you have a parent element and it has child elements. A uh, child element can have child elements and so on, but remember this structure. To make everything smoothly, we have created an XML schema, which tells how these elements that you are going to hear about today uh, and also the attributes can and have to be used. And furthermore, we also give data types. So we define what the element and attributes can contain. Is it text? Is it numbers? And so on. So making sure that you can use them as they are expected to be used. And the final thing is namespace, a tricky, a tricky, tricky thing to actually really thoroughly explain, but it's the home space for elements and attributes in the schema. So making sure that what we are doing are have its own space and all the things that we are describing is in this space. And with that, I'm actually going to jump directly into the XML. So the structure of EAC is that you have a root element being EAC, and then you have two uh, child elements. You have control, which is information about the XML file itself. Uh, you will hear a lot more about that later on, so I'm not going to really dwell into that one. The other part is CPF description. There is where you describe the entity, uh, the corporate body, the person, or the family. Moving into the CPF description, we have three sub elements or three child elements where the identity is the first one. It's required. It's there where you find information about the type of entity you are describing, uh, identifiers, and you can have as many as you want, and also the name. And the name is also possible to give in all the ways that are needed something you will see later on. Uh, then we have the description. So we want to describe these enti entities that we are creating an ESC CPF record for. So you have two types of descriptive elements, some that are more uh, purposed for it being indexed and others where you give you give existence, functions, or occupations. You can give long biographical uh, notes and so on. And you can write as narrative as you want or be as short as you want. So everything is possible. This is a short example where you can see you can write both longer text and you can write, uh, for example, place name is something that you might index. So that's really short and you have really short descriptions or you can have a long description. The last part is the relations. So when you are describing an entity, you really want to link it with other corporate bodies, persons or families. Uh, you might want to link it to the archival resource that this entity has created or you want to connect it with functions or something else. So that's what you do in the relations area. When you will look at this example of a relation, it's all centered about how the person we actually were describing is connected to other persons in the family. But I know we will be touching in on this later on today. So why do we have these relations? Well. We need to link the entity we have created with, with other things. Um, actually, we can link to other things being present on the internet because someone, some per, something we are connecting to might not be in our custody. So we actually point to something else. And this actually makes it easier to find the archival materials and get the, those these big, some say the complex world of, in, of archival material make it easier to understand. We can click, click ourselves around and find and make new connections and find new information. So 
we have created, we have all the data we want to have, then we need to create these EAC CPF documents. And there are some different ways of doing that. Uh, the three usual examples are, are that you might have an XML editor, so you make the, this all by hand. You can have scripts that help you to create this, or you actually have this as part of your collection management system. So they actually create the AC CPF files for you. When we have the files, we want to publish them because we want other people and the re researchers to actually see them. So then you can actually transform the XML into something that is browser readable, like HTML. Uh, your collection man management system can have a part where, which actually shows the patrons your descriptions, or they, it can be a special system for this. So giving some examples on where you can see EAC CPF in, in being used is in 2012, you had a project named Connecting the Dots, Samuel Johnson and his circle at the Uton Library and Beinecke Library, where they actually described Samuel Johnson and all his connections using EAC CPF. And they do, did amazing graphs of showing how people were connected and everything. Uh, we have SNAC, the Social Networks and Archival Context, which is uh, uh, present in the US where you also have other people or other countries have supplied information. There you also can see people and how they are connected. And they are using ESC CPF as the format for describing the people or all the corp uh, corporate bodies or families. And the last one is actually Archives Portal Europe, where all the archival creators have an ESC CPF record Show, showing you the information about the creators. With that quick start and loop into EICCBF, I'm going to hand it over to Marie and Kirsten. So I know Marie is starting. Please take it off. Um, and just before I do, in case anyone came in a little bit later, I'm going to put the PDF, the link to the PDF of the slides one more time in the chat. Um, and uh, as Karen said, you'll have to download the PDF to click on the links, but then you'll be able to, to see this. Um, so the focus of today is on the updates and how everything works. So I'm going to be very brief uh, to summarize the revision process. Um, so just for context, we're at just over 10 years since the adoption of the original version of EAC CPF, um, which was in 2010. Um, slide. Yeah, the first major revision, which the team began working on in 2017, um, they released, um, I say they because I hadn't joined yet, um, released a minor update the following year and then placed a call for comments on that version. So the resulting overhaul of the standard was submitted to the Standards Committee and the SAA Council earlier this year and approved in August. The overall goals for the revision were to simplify where possible, align with EAD where it makes sense, implement features and solutions based on user feedback, and clearing up any unused components. And you can find a very detailed explanation of the revision process on the EAC CPF website. Um, on, the on the sidebar menu, there's EAC CPF 2.0 background. That, if you go to that page and click on revision notes, you'll see a very long detailed explanation of the process. Um, but I'm gonna give an overview of some of these changes. Um, the goal of EAD alignment is to meet the user community's needs and make it easier to maintain and use the EAC CPF uh, schema. So as part of this alignment with EAD, some elements were renamed uh, and some were renamed to be more precise. So ideally these changes make the schema easier to use and understand. Also as part of the alignment, um, some elements were removed or replaced, sometimes by a new equivalent term and sometimes by uh, 
transformation. So it would be a combination, maybe of an element and attribute now to represent uh, the same information. To simplify uh, with regards to elements, EAC CPF 2.0 bundles elements in these two ways. Uh, elements of the same type can be bundled with a wrapper as plural elements, and elements with different concepts can be grouped in element sets. And we will see examples of these as we go. Um, further regarding the simplification, there's a prescribed order for elements within the parent element, so prioritizing required and non-repeatable elements. Restrictions were relaxed for some element content and attribute values. Uh, so these are just some examples um, for the element agency code, the ISO constraint is relaxed to text. And for the country language and script code attributes, the ISO standards constraint is relaxed to name token. I will mention a couple more things, but we'll be covering again this in more detail, uh, starting with control. Um, but these are some examples, and we'll have some examples of encoding, but these are um, some examples of how the new attributes align with EAD. And these optional elements as well. The removal and replacement of some attributes regarding external namespaces, as Karin was mentioning earlier about namespace, this also furthers the alignment with EAD. And finally, there are these five new or replacement global attributes. Um, we'll have a detailed explanation of internal and external referencing later, again with examples. So I will just move on to Kirsten to start with control. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so Marie gave you the, the quick overview. Uh, we're now going to dive a little bit in more detail into specific sections of ESC CPF, respectively specific uh, types of information that you might want to encode. Uh, next slide, please. We're going to start with control. And Marie already mentioned that we have transformed some elements into attributes, uh, specifically in the control section, where we essentially kind of uh, have all the information that we need to manage the ESCCPF file in itself. Uh, we felt like this um, would help us to kind of get the process more streamlined. And um, there are four elements um, that we have treated that way. Um, so we've got the maintenance status and the publication status. So that is telling you something about um, the, the processing stage, so to say, of the ECCPF file. And next slide, please. And then we have um, the maintenance event type and the agent type. They are both in the uh, maintenance history of the ESC CPF file. Um, and all four of them currently come with a list of limited values. Um, and you can see uh, with the asterisk um, that we are already kind of reviewing this again because um, next to the ESC CPF revision, we also have started a major revision of EAD. So uh, the wheels are turning already, even though we only just published ESC CPF 2.0. Next slide, please. We also have a few new um, attributes and um, possibilities to internally reference from one part of ECCPF to the other. Um, and in turn, that re re results into some sub elements of the control section being emphasized more. So ideally, you would kind of use a control section, for example, to provide information about any rules um, or, or conventions that you have been following by creating the ECCPF instance, any sources that you have used, uh, and then also kind of detailing uh, who was involved in the creation or later on the updates of the ECCPF file. So all of these elements now have an ID attribute so that they can be pointed to. Um, and we have um, reference attributes that you will find all over the place in the descriptive part of ECCPF in order to point to those parts in control. Next slide, please. Um, just as, as kind of a use case and moving away a little bit for, for, for a second from the uh, XML encoding. Um, so you could say, I want to start a new ECCPF record for my working group and document when, when I did it. 
So you would want to have a unique ID for the record. Uh, you will want to mention who has created it. Um, and you might also want to record a date when it was created. And if you go to the next slide, we already see how this would look like in the ECCPF encoding. And that is essentially everything that you need to have. So all the mandatory information that you need to have when creating an ECCPF file in the control section. So you can see it's not that much. Um, there are lots of other possibilities what you can include, but kind of to start with, uh, you would have kind of relatively short control section with the main information. Next slide, please. Uh, we can spin this a little bit further. So if we wanted to say that um, the document is in draft, but it's already public, um, then we can use the audience attribute saying that everything that is in here is external and can be used by anyone. Uh, but we can also indicate the publication status as being in process so that users already know that there might be more information added in a later stage. And then, um, and um, Marie already mentioned those um, attributes as well. Uh, I might also want to point to specific data standards that I'm using in the context of the record. So if I'm using a specific um, date encoding standard like the ISO standard 8601 um, throughout the record when, for example, talking about birth dates or death dates of the person that I'm describing, then I can point to that in the control section, uh, which also helps in validation, but also helps others to understand how your data has been encoded. Next slide, please. This is how this would look like in control. So you can see um, there's just one element, the control element, and then all the extra information is essentially kind of packed away into attributes. All of these attributes are optional, so you don't have to use them, but you can use them. Next slide. Uh, looking a little bit into the maintenance event as one example, um, as that is also part of the mandatory information that we would want to have. Um, so you might want to make an internal note in the record about what you did, why and when. Um, and you can do all of that in the maintenance event element. Um, so you have the name, uh, you have a date and maybe a time when something has happened. And you can also include a description of what you have done. And if we go to the next slide, you can see how this looks like in the ECCPF encoding. So we've got the maintenance event as the parent um, element in this context. And you can see that we have three child elements, the agent, which gives you the person or in this um, context, the group that has created the ECCPF file. We've got event date time, which gives you the date um, and more specifically the time if you need it in the normalized version. And then you have event description where you can essentially kind of include any longer text that you might want to provide. Next slide, please. Going into the section of linking and referencing, and we can just move on to the next slide, we have essentially kind of two different ways of referencing. And we are looking at external referencing in terms of pointing out of the ECCPF file to a resource that is somewhere else. And there are different ways to do this. Um, what we have included in this new version is a set of three attributes to point to external vocabularies or ontologies. So something like Wikidata, something like VF, something like the Library of Congress subject headings, um, all of that could be included in those three attributes. Uh, we have referencing to sources that you have used in creating the ECCPF file. Um, and the source element can, for this, have a sub element called reference, uh, which you can use for either analog um, sources or including the href attribute also point to online sources. Um, and the same principle with reference is also available throughout the um, ECCPF file in the descriptive part, if you want to kind of provide any external resources for more context. Next slide, please. These are some encodings, how this could look like. So at the top, we have a, a source where we point specifically to catalog entry at the Barack Obama Presidential Library. Um, the second example is using the um, vocabulary referencing. Uh, so you can see that in this case, we are pointing to Wikidata um, and the 
entry about Barack Obama on there. And then in the relation part, the third example um, essentially kind of gives some more context information uh, by pointing to a Wikipedia page. Next slide, please. Next to that, we also have the internal referencing. And I also mentioned the ID attribute, which is available in every element that there is in ECCPF, apart from the root element EEC itself. Uh, and going along with this is the target attribute. So you essentially kind of have something where you can point to with ID and something where you can point from with the target attribute. Um, so you can essentially kind of reference from any element within an ESCCPF document to any other element within the same document. Um, and then we have these more specific target attributes, so to say, that I briefly mentioned earlier in the context of control. Uh, and we go to the next slide, we'll see what these look like. Actually, this is just, sorry, an example still for, for target and ID. Um, so just having a look at this, so at the top, you can see that um, in the context of occupation, a place is just generally named. And then the target is pointing to an actual place element where you can then have more detailed information about the place, like giving the place a role and including address information. Next slide, please. Now we come to the more specific target attributes and we have generally called that assertion description. Um, it is something that is coming from the context of SNAC. So this is picking up on community feedback. And if you are familiar with SNAC, you might know that essentially there are different people, um, editors uh, who have run through a, a certain training um, working on the same ECCPF file. So in that context, it's really essential to know who did what, when, and based on which sources. And this is what we are doing here. So we have created uh, three new attributes, maintenance event reference that allows you to point to who did what, when, uh, source reference that allows you to point to a source and convention declaration reference that allows you to point to any rule that has been applied by creating the content. And that's especially useful in case of conflicting statements. So you might already have had a description of a person and then uh, a few years later, someone does a little bit more of research and uh, for example, a new date of birth appears. Um, and you might want to include that in your ECCPF um, description, <clears throat> but you might also want to identify that this is something that is new and might be something that still needs to be confirmed. Um, and this is where these attributes come in. Next slide, please. And these are, again, a few examples for this. And you can see that um, we again use the, the ID attribute because that's something that we always need to have in order to point uh, to elements. And then the relation at the bottom essentially kind of includes the source reference as an example and the maintenance event reference as a second example, um, where you can see that this is pointing to the first two entries. Next slide, please. Similarly, uh, we also have um, a concept that is called local types, and that's something that already was in, in ECCPF in the, in the previous version, um, but we are again kind of emphasizing that concept a little bit more. So in some elements in the descriptive part, you might have a local type where you can include any typing that you might use in your context. But as we also think about ECCPF as something that you might want to share, for example, in the context of an aggregator like Snack or Arcas Portal Europe, uh, it's of course good if you can tell people what you actually mean by these local types. So similarly to what we have with the convention declaration reference and the other reference attributes, if we go to the next slide, we also have a local type declaration reference option. Um, so essentially in the control section, you have local type declaration and you can point to, for example, a locally used vocabulary or terminology list um, that you might want to use throughout the ECCPF description. And then in the actual descriptive part, for example, with a name entry, you can point back to that local type declaration. Next slide, please. 
Now we go into the section of looking at specific pieces of information that you might want to encode and how this is done in ECCPF 2.0. And we start with the names as being one of the most important aspects in describing a person, a corporate body or a family. Um, so the next slide, please. Uh, we have renamed the, the grouping element. Um, so um, Marie mentioned earlier that we have plural elements and set elements in order to group different child elements together. Um, in the context of name entries, um, the initial name was name entry parallel, uh, which throughout the revision process, we found out that this is very specific to a certain way to encode names in the US-based context, but doesn't necessarily translate into other international contexts. So we decided to rename that into name entry set. And we also transformed a few of the sub elements in the context of encoding names. Um, and again, we essentially kind of transformed elements into attributes. Um, and if we go to the next slide, we have an encoding example, um, how this would look like now. Uh, so uh, again, for example, in, in, in the terms of names, you might want to reference a specific convention or rule that you have been following. For example, if you always have the last name first, then a comma, then the first name. Um, and in the name entry itself, you can, for example, declare that uh, a specific name entry is the preferred form. So if someone went by a certain name that isn't necessarily their birth name, you can use the preferred form attribute to indicate that. And you can also indicate whether that name entry is an authorized name or is a name that is an alternative for specifically in the context of corporate bodies. If you have an institution like this one here, uh, which is um, in, an international one, uh, you might have the name in different languages and all of them might be authorized. But if you have an institution that is placed only, for example, in Spain, um, then you might probably have the, the Spanish name as the authorized one and a translation of the name into English might just be an alternative form of that. Next slide, please. Uh, just going into the name entry set, so uh, showing a few variations, what you can do with this. So in a name entry set, you can have several name entries. Um, and for example, you can put name entries in different languages in there. So each language would have their own name entry tag um, and you can kind of um, include specific information with regard to what type of language you, you have the name in. Uh, you might also want to indicate the script if that is relevant in the context. And you can, again, kind of play with the preferred form, true or false, and with authorized or non-authorized names. Uh, respectively, also using the local type if you wanted to, to indicate that something is the native language of the person and something is a translation. Next slide, please. The next piece of information that we want to look at is place encoding. Uh, this is something where there was a mix between things with, that we included as something new because we thought thought that it is essential kind of just moving on to um, the more digital way of doing things and things that we have aligned with EED. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, please. We are uh, essentially decide, uh, differentiating between two different use cases when we talk about places. Uh, we have one part of the description where you can encode places in full. So we have a plural element places. Um, and then we have um, other bits and pieces in the description where we might just want to name a place um, as, as one thing. And then you can kind of reference to the more detailed description if available um, and if wanted. Next slide, please. Place in itself in the full description requires at least one of the following sub elements. So either the name of the place, which is highly recommended, um, the role of the place you can define. So you can define a, a place as being the birthplace of a person or a workplace of a person. We have a possibility to encode a physical address. And then one thing that we added new is the possibility to next to that also encode digital address information, for example, a website or an email. 
um, and we adopted the possibility to encode geographic coordinates from EAD. Furthermore, you can also add date information and informational description to place element if that is relevant in the context of the overall description. Next slide, please. And this is just an example on how this could look like if you were to use all the sub elements of the place element. So we start with the place name. Uh, you can see that there also is a country code that you can indicate uh, specifically if you're having a, a place that might appear in different countries. Uh, you can give the place role, uh, geographic coordinates. Um, the address uh, is broken down into different address lines um, and each address line can be typed. So you can specify which part of the address is the street and maybe the house number, which is the name of the city, which is the postal code in this case. And the same principle also applies to the contact information where we have contact line elements. In this case, we have included the home page. Um, the next one is date encoding, and you can go to the next slide, please, Karen. Thank you. Um, and we have specifically looked at the possibility of encoding uncertain approximate and ongoing dates, which was something that you couldn't do in the previous version of ESC. Um, so this is, again, something where we picked up on user feedback. Um, so we now have a possibility to include a statement of uncertainty. So we adopted the certainty element uh, attribute from EAD. Uh, we have a possibility to include normalized uncertainty. So we have kind of extended the use of ISO 8601 to the current version with the extended date time format. Um, and we also have a possibility to indicate a date's status with the new attribute status. Um, and uh, you can use the values unknown or ongo ongoing uh, in this context, with specifically in context of describing persons or institutions, um, could be valuable. Next slide, please. This is how this could look like. So um, you've got the certainty attribute, which is really just a, an open text attribute. You can include anything that you want in there. Um, then a date range where we have um, the start date unknown. Um, and for the end date, we have an approximate date. Um, and this is also expressed in the normalized version. And then in the third example, we have a date set. And you can see that the date range that is included in there is ongoing. So this is something that is still very current. Next slide, please. And the last one is relations. Um, so Karen already mentioned relations are um, at a very prominent place in the context of ECCBF. Um, and we adapted a little bit how this can be encoded. So if we go to the next slide, please, we can have a look at that. Um, so we decided to not differentiate uh, with the element between what type of entity we are relating to. So we only have the general relations element now. Uh, and within relation, you can um, name the target entity. So name the other person that you're pointing to or name the resource that you're pointing to because that has been created by the person that you are describing. Um, and we ha have the attribute target type going with that where you can indicate what type of entity it is that you are pointing to. Um, and this is picking up essentially on what we had previously. So you can have the target type person, family, corporate body, or more generally agent. Uh, you can have a target type function and target type resource. Next slide, please. Furthermore, we have included two new um, uh, elements where you can more specifically describe the relation that the two entities have with each other. Relation type is the more general one. So that gives you kind of a, a general relationship description between the entity that you are describing in ECCPF and the other entity that you're pointing to. And target role gives the, you the possibility to more specifically describe what role the targeted entity plays towards the entity that you are describing. And on the next slide, we have an encoding example for how this could look like. Uh, so here we are pointing to 
Paul Arendt in the context of describing Hannah Arendt. Uh, you can see that there also are a few of these vocabulary attributes in there again. So we are pointing to kind of a, a, a standardized description of Paul Arendt. And with the relation type, we say that there is a family relation between both of them. And in the target role, we can more specifically say that Paul Arendt is a parent, or we could also say is the father of Anna Arendt. Next slide, please. And this is where I hand back over to Marie for the documentation part. And before I start, I'm just gonna, I'm actually gonna put these links in the chat as well. They are linked from the presentation, but just for easy reference. Um, so that this is a, a brief overview of the highlights and changes that we think will be most noticeable and useful to the user community. Um, but you can see everything in detail on the EAC CPF website. Um, again, details of the revision, but the link to the tag library, uh, the link to the TSEAS GitHub site, um, where you also find the best practice guide. Um, so our EAC CPF team member Iris has created a short tutorial video, which is linked there in the SAA YouTube channel, which shows you how to navigate through the best practice guide. And next slide. So we have shown peppered throughout examples. Um, here we have examples on GitHub. Um, there's a fully encoded um, example of an EAC CPF record, an extended example. There's a brief example, and there are two um, just sort of sample <laughs> records that have um, more than generic information in them. But we very much want to see how you are using EAC CPF. Um, we would like the best practice guide to include your use cases, examples, um, and you can submit examples and communicate with us um, issues through the GitHub site or by contacting us. Um, we want, again, the best practice guide and our documentation to be useful and a community effort. Um, and with that, I think there is time, Karin, for questions. If anyone has any, you can put them in the chat. Exactly. So so you just said what I was planning to say. So <laughs> my big congratulations to the whole EAC CPF team for doing this work. And really, we were really proud having it being approved and being announced on the 3rd of August this year. So it's available and it's ready for everybody to use. So as uh, Marie said, please put your questions in the chat. And I will actually try to do this magic of stopping the recording. So many thanks for attending and please feel free to ask questions.